السلام ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي خلق السماوات والأرض وجعل الظلمات والنور ثم الذين كفروا بربهم يعدلون وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بشر وأنذر لا خير إلا دل الأمة عليه ولا شر إلا حذرها منه فصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهداه إلى يوم الدين نسأل الله جل وعلا أن يبصرنا بالحق وأن يمن علينا بالالتزام به والثبات عليه حتى يتوفانا وهو راض عنا اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا وعملا متقبلا اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا شقيا ولا محروما اللهم إنا نعوذ بك أن نضل أو نضل أو نزل أو نزل أو نظلم أو نظلم أو نجهل أو يجهل علينا اللهم آمين All praise is due to Allah Azza wa Jal We praise Him, we thank Him, we seek His assistance, we seek His tawfiq We pray to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us that which is beneficial to us and give us the tawfiq to apply it اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم and for the Rasool, for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينَ Whoever Allah Azza wa Jal wants khair for, he will make him comprehend the religion. And the scholars have understood from this hadith the flip, code, the flip side of it. Whoever Allah Azza wa Jal does not want khair for, he does not make him comprehend the religion. 
Subhanallah. So it goes both ways. Whoever Allah Azza wa Jal wants khair for, He will make him comprehend the religion. Because Wallahi, that is all the khair. And if He doesn't want for somebody khair, then He will not make him understand the religion. So we seek Allah Azza wa Jal assistance and help and tawfiq to teach us and show us that which is beneficial and that which is khair for us and give us the tawfiq to learn it and apply it. Innahu waliyu dhalika wal qadiru alayh. I welcome you on this night of the third of Rabi' al Awwal of the Hijri year 1438 since Hijrat al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which also translates into the third of December of the year 2016 of the Gregorian calendar. And I know we have some brothers and sisters probably online, but. Uh, I'm wondering what's happening today. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing as many faces as we've been getting used to. I don't know if two days in succession are making people tired uh, or what. I know it gets get tired and we have to understand, Ya Akhwan, that and you're seeing it, right? Learning the beneficial ilm and acquiring the beneficial knowledge, right, is not easy. It's not easy. It takes patience. It takes perseverance. And don't think ever that the scholars who, who mashallah, Allah Azza wa Jal blessed them, blessed them by large amounts of information, don't think that they actually learned and acquired this overnight or over a month or over a year. And also while sitting on a couch and taking it easy. It doesn't happen. That's not the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal in this universe. <laughs> you don't get anywhere that way. Right? You want to learn, you have a speci specific goal in your mind, and you know the path for it, right? You're clear, and you know what your target is, and what your goal is. You're going to have to work for it, toward it. it doesn't, there's nothing easy. This life is not easy, right? It's not easy. When can we take a break and, you know, take it easy? When we step inside Jannah, bi idhnillahi ta'ala. You know, Imam Ahmad, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, one of the great a'imma of Islam, he was asked, Ya Imam, when does the son of Adam feel, uh, you know, ease or, or you, know, you know, rest? When can he or she have rest? He said, when they step inside Jannah. That's it. Which we pray to Allah Azza wa Jal to make us among its people. Allahumma ameen. So, Ya Akhwan, this life is meant to be, to have difficulties and you have to actually have patience to get to your goal, you know. Success is not easy, win is not easy, right? We will have to work for it. But with the tawfiq of Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, we'll get there. And that's very important. We say it's not easy. How do we get there? Not by our own power or not by our own, you know, intelligence or... Um, It is by the tawfiq of Allah Azza wa Jal, by His help, right? By the tawfiq of Allah Azza wa Jal. That, with that said, um, Subhanallah. Obviously, it, you know, when I try to prepare for today's halaqa, uh, I also it, it proved it proved pretty challenging for me to literally prepare for three halaqat, you know, in two days, uh, two tracks today, and yesterday we had the monthly halaqa. Wallahi ya akhwan, it proved to be pretty difficult, challenging. It's not easy, subhanAllah. So I apologize. I actually could not prepare for the fiqh part of it. Uh, but I was able by the tawfiq of Allah Azza wa Jal to prepare for the first track. So inshallah, I didn't want to cancel because I think it still is pretty important to get together, not to miss. And uh, there is quite a bit of information for the first track. So I decided to come and, you know, get together. Inshallah, we don't want to miss this opportunity. We don't want to miss the ajr. Right? We don't want this week to just go like this, like that. But we want to amass and learn and, and get the ajr bi idhnillahi ta'ala. So that's why I, I decided to, um, uh, to come and, and do it. Um, so as we said, right, we're uh, in the process of explaining this great book and short text of, that is titled Al-Aqidah Al-Tahawiyyah. Right? And this text is actually uh, written by uh, the great scholar, 
Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi from Egypt, and last week we started with a uh, kind of introduction to this, right? So we talked, we gave a short biography of Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi. We talked about where he was born and what he did and, you know, the great work that he did uh, during his life. Uh, and mashallah, he contrib contributed a lot in terms of books. One of them is this uh, short book that is called al aqid al tahawiyah that we are in the process of explaining. And like I said, and I repeat, we're actually, um, uh, yani our explanation or commentary, if you wish, is actually based off of the commentary of Imam Ibn Abi Al-Izz, another great scholar of Madhab Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. Both of them are from Madhab Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. He actually uh, expended his commentary on it, and this is what we're actually basing of, off of. So, and you're going to see me that I refer to it uh, quite a bit. Like we said last week, Akhwan, and you know, just so that we kind of quickly go over this, we said that studying al aqidah is very important. As a matter of fact, this is the first wajib that every Muslim has to do before any of the other orders or prohibitions. The first wajib is to actually understand the aqidah, is to actually uh, uh, know who the Lord is and who the Creator is, right? And to know His qualities and His attributes and His beautiful names and to know what His rights upon you are, right? That's what it first. And that's why, um, if you remember, we actually mentioned this uh, Imam Abin Abil Izz al Hanafi he actually referred to this as Al Fuqh al Akbar. And he said this is actually taken from Al Imam Abu Hanifa. He referred to Al Imam Abu Hanifa saying that he calling Al Aqida as Al Fuqh al Akbar compared to Al Fuqh that we know now, right? Salah, Siyam, purity, as Fuqh al Furu' which is the branch of the, of the Fuqh. But the essence of Fuqh. And al-fiqh al-akbar, the greatest fiqh, is actually al-aqidah, and he also referred to it as the most honorable of the sciences. Ashraf al-uloom. Because he said, al-uloom, the sciences, the different pieces of knowledge, are not of the same honor. Some of them are more honorable than others, and some of them are less. What makes the science more honorable compared to other? It is based of the information in it. What does it teach you about? And we know that Al-Aqeedah, it teaches us about who? Allah Azza wa Jal. So the honor of the science is taken from the honor of what you study in that science. And no question about it that knowing about Allah Azza wa Jal is the most honorable thing. And this is what makes Ilm Al-Aqeedah Ashraf al ulum the most honorable of the sciences. And we can say that the need for to learn this science is the greatest need for the son of Adam. So we need to know about a lot of things. But our need, my need and each of you, each one of you, the need, our need to know about Allah Azza wa Jal and to learn Ilm al aqidah is the greatest need. For sure, it is greater than any other need to know about. So this is so important, Ya Akhwan. So we, this is what we should start with. And then, once we know that, right, then we go, then we should know that Allah Azza wa Jal has mandated certain things upon us, and He forbid other things on us. So now you know what His orders are, and what His prohibitions are. And the second principle, is to actually know what Allah Azza wa Jal has set as reward for those who obey His orders and what severe punishment for those who disobey His orders. Right? And by the way, this is something that we may not actually under realize or recognize, but if you read the whole Quran, it's about these three things. About who Allah is, about what his orders are and prohibitions, and about what he is preparing as reward for those who obey him, or punishment for those who disobey him. That's it. Every ayah of the Quran, every ayah of every surah, it has to, do, to talk about one of these. 
And so this is what makes it so important. And like I said, you know, again, you know, the reason we are discussing this is because some people think that you know, the aqidah is boring or not so important, right? But we said that this is actually wrong. And we know that you know, a good uh, evidence to this is that all the scholars, including Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi, they actually made it a, one of their sunnah to actually write author books about al-aqidah because when they saw after a period of time from the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we said the first few generation were clear and were on the path and were on the clean and clear tawhid but then things and ideologies started to come inside right and affect people's uh, understanding so the uh, scholars have sensed the need to actually write about that and we can see, and we've seen actually, and we mentioned many, many books of Aqidah that the scholars have, uh, over the time, have written. And they made it a point or made sure to actually teach it to their pupils and to their students and companions, right? And to actually make them memorize it so that they understand it themselves and to make them comprehend and understand it and then carry it on and transfer it to the next generation and we see that so this understanding how did this understanding by the way get to us nothing except that it was transferred one generation to none to the next every generation explains this aqidah and how we should believe in allah azza wa jal to the next generation and so on and so forth and by the way this is one of the ways that allah azza wa jal preserved this deep and it shows us that Allah Azza wa Jal is very caring about his deen to preserve it. That he actually made certain people learn and become scholars and take it upon them to actually transfer this knowledge clear and pure. Preserve happen it's gonna collapse and it's gonna be wrong when you want to build this building of Islam it has to have a very sound and strong foundation otherwise it won't be accepted from Allah Azza wa Jal um, also what we said and this is based on the text of al aqidah al tahawiyya um, and by the way, like I said, you know, the Aqidah has been actually split into statements and this is where you're going to see in here. You see this uh, number one and number two. So this is going to be actually, this is how our methodology is going to be. It's going to be based on statement by statement. So it started by saying that Hujjat al-Islam, the great scholar Abu Ja'far al-Tuhawi uh, in Egypt, may Allah have mercy upon him, said and then it started to list those statements after that. And we, like I said, we talked about Imam Abu Ja'far and some of his uh, biography, short biography. The first statement, and this is also something that we covered last week, but real quick, uh, it says, this is a mention of an explanation of the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah upon the way of the jurists of the religion. Abu Hanifa, an numan ibn Thabit al-Kufi, rahimahullahu ta'ala, and Abu Yusuf Ya'qub ibn Ibrahim al-Ansari, and Abu Abdullah Muhammad, uh, Muhammad ibn al Hassan al Shaybani, may Allah be pleased with them all, and what they held as their creed from the fundamentals of the religion, and what they held as a religion in obedience to the Lord of the creation. Wa ta so, this we said that this introduction, and this, uh, and this is actually from the very text of Imam Abu Jafar. Yani this is something that he started as an introduction. And he's confirming in this introduction that this is actually the aqidah of al Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, and the aqidah and the set of beliefs that his two students or famous students, uh, uh, Muhammad and Abu Yusuf, 
both of them also held in terms of their creed. And also he said that this is also the Aqeedah of Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. So this means that it actually matches also the Aqeedah of Imam Malik and the Aqeedah of Imam Ahmad and the Aqeedah of Imam Shafi'i and all the scholars, the rest of them, because Ahlu Sunnati, it covers all of them. So we see that it actually there is no difference in, the, in terms of Aqeedah or understanding of the Aqeedah among the scholars. The differences of opinion is only in, in fiqh al-furu' right? In, 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 in matters of related to salah, purity, they may have a disagreement uh, in terms of opinion of how they understood the hadith or what, or what not. But in terms of Aqeedah, they actually, it overlaps and they have the same set of beliefs, there is absolutely no difference among them. So they have the same belief, set of belief in Allah Azza wa Jal. And we also said, and I repeat just because it is quite important, we said that this also proves a very important, important point, is that this is the Aqeedah of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. Today we have people who actually connect and say, we are, I am following Madhab al-Imam Abu Hanifa. I am on Madhab al-Hanafi. Yet we see that they don't have the same belief as Imam Abu Hanifa. They don't follow him. As a matter of fact, some of their sayings and some of their beliefs contradict sharply 180 degrees with what Imam Abu Hanifa is saying or believed. As yet we see Yet, in the matter of Aqeedah, which is Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar, and the foundation of the deen, you disagree with him so, so sharply. You basically say the very opposite. And when we come to some of these statements, we're going to point them out. And we're going to call them out. And we're going to say, this is what he said. Where do you guys stand with respect to that? Right? So, when you say that I am on Madhab Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, you should follow him in everything. And this is the first thing that you should start with. So it is very important that, you know, we understand that if you want to follow, if you claim that you are on the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, you should, you should start with and you should actually align yourself with what he held as a belief to Allah Azza wa Jal. The next statement he said, نَقُولُ فِي تَوْحِيدِ اللَّهِ مُعْتَقِدِينَ بِتَوْفِيقِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَاحِدٌ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهِ Which roughly translates into, now obviously again, Imam Abu Ja'far is the one who's talking. And it has been narrated that he actually said these statements to his students one of them has written it down, right, on paper. So he's basically telling them what to write, and, he's, and they're writing it down. So he is saying, we say, with regard to Tawheed of Allah. Due to the guidance of correctness granted by Allah, that Allah is one and having no partner. So he immediately started from the very first statement, talking about the very important topic of Tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this again, it shows us the importance of this, and it shows us that this is something that we should all have a very sound understanding of, right? And this is what we should, this is what we should start with. Now you're gonna notice that a lot of what we're gonna say today is something that hopefully, hopefully, if you guys have been awake before and with me, right? Some of what we're going to say today should actually sound familiar because we've seen this before, right? For those who remember, when we were going through Tawheed, remember? We actually talked, this was the first thing that we talked about, and although it may have been a little quicker, right? Maybe uh, in a kind of uh, more concise format, but a lot of it should actually sound uh, pretty familiar to you guys because like I said we've actually seen this before Tawheed ya akhwan notice that he said and let me actually point to what I'm referring to ok 
Okay. He said, Tawheedullah. Right? So in here he is referring to a Tawheed. Right? What is Tawheed? We say Tawheed, the word Tawheed comes from the word, from the origin of the word, Wahada yuwahidu Tawheedan. Which is to make something one. Yani, you say, Wahadtu, yani, I made that thing one. And in the Sharia, it, it is to actually uh, make Allah Azza wa Jal one, right? In His Lordship, in His divinity, in His attributes and names. Al Asma al Husna was Sifat al Ula, the good names or the great names and the sublime attributes. This Tawheed, before we go into these three uh, kind of categories, right? But we want to actually see, is this, again, is this the first thing that we should start with? Why is Al Imam Abu Ja'far starting with this with the very first statement? As soon as he got started on his Aqeedah, in his matters of Aqeedah, he immediately started talking about, about the Tawheed. Why is that? We say that because this is actually the essence of the messages of all the messengers and the prophets of Allah Azza wa And by the way, Al Imam Ibn Abi Al-Izz Al Hanafi in his commentary, and like I said, we're actually all of our explanation is based on that. He actually said that know that the Tawheed is the first thing that the messengers were sent with. And that it was the first thing that they called upon their people to. Right? And it is also the beginning of the road of the servant toward his Lord or her Lord. So the road to Allah Azza wa Jal is obviously a long road. Right? It's a long way. The fir beginning of this way should start with knowing it Tawheed. And he said that this is actually the first thing that the messengers called their people toward. And by the way, I found it quite interesting, or quite even striking, to, subhanAllah, when you put the ayat next to each other, you're going to see a striking similarity. And Imam Ibn Ibn Izz al-Hanafi, as a matter of fact, he said that Allah Azza wa Jal says in those ayat, the first one in Surah An-Nisa, the ayah 69, Allah Azza wa Jal said, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَقَالَ يَا قَوْمِ عَبُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَاهٍ and the tra literal translation of this ayah is that Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, and we sent Nuh to his people and he said, my people serve Allah. Uh, you have no other God than him or than he. Hud alayhi salam, this is Nuh. What did Hud say to his people? He said, اِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَاهٍ غَيْرُهُ Hud said, Serve Allah, there is no God for you but He. Then Salih alayhi salam, he said to his people, and this is in ayat al in Surah Al-A'raf, The exact, very same exact word. And Allah Azza wa Jal is repeating their stories. So Salih alayhi salam, he said to his people, Worship Allah as you have no God but He. Then Shu'aib came afterward, and he said alayhi salam, this is the first thing that he said to his people. So Shu'aib said, we worship Allah, you have no God but He. Then Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ اللَّهَ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Now obviously Allah Azza wa Jal did not tell us the stories of every single messenger. He mentioned a few. And these are a few and you notice the similarity in what they said. This is the first message that they delivered to their people. The first message that they delivered to people, اِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرُهُ Worship Allah, for you have no God but Him. Then Allah Azza wa Jal said, for the rest of the messengers, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا And I have commanded, or, or I'm sorry, not a messenger did we send before you, meaning, O Muhammad, um, actually, I'm sorry, we sent to every community a prophet saying, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Saying, 
there, there is no God but I, so worship me and serve me. So Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us that this is actually the message of every, of every prophet and of every messenger. And then Allah Azza wa Jal said, Nope, sorry, I have, I, I guess I have my, oh here. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ And this is in Surah Al-Anbiya. Allah Azza wa Jal said in this ayah, And I have not, another messenger did we send before you, O Muhammad, without our revelation to him, is that there is no God but I, so worship and serve me. All of this, ya shows us that this is actually the very first message this is the very first, the essence of the message of these messengers and prophets alayhim salatu to their, to their people. And this is what we should also start with. Right. Now that we know that this is actually the first message that we should learn about, and this is the first message of the, of the messengers alayhim salatu wassalam, what are the different categories of Tawheed? We said that the Tawheed is divided into three categories. Namely, Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, Tawheed al-Asma wa sifat which is the Tawheed in Godship, Tawheed in Divinity, and the Tawheed in the beautiful names of Allah Azza wa Jal and His sublime attributes, right? Some of you, or this is actually, you know, it's, it is a legitimate question. Some of the people who may not agree with us on this kind of division, and this is something that you guys should remember and should understand how to actually answer that. Because I'm pretty sure you're going to be asked this question, right? Where some people may say, well, we, do, we don't agree with you. Where did you get this understanding from? How can you prove that really Tawheed is actually three parts or three categories? Where did you get this from? We say that this is actually coming from contemplating the Quran. If you read the Quran, and if you contemplate what Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, you, there is no way but you're going to come up with these three categories. Tawheed Allah Azza wa Jal in his Godship. Because we see that there are some ayat where Allah Azza wa Jal is talking about himself as being the creator, the sustainer, the maintainer. And there are other ayat where Allah Azza wa Jal is talking about that he is the only God. And he is the only div divine, true God to be worshipped. Not only that, he made a distinction between those who believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only creator, yet Allah Azza wa Jal still called them mushrikeen or kuffar. That tells us that there is something that they did not actually believe in that still made them as non-Muslim, right? So then there is a distinction between the different categories of Tawheed. Not only that, we also say that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala and Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi and Imam Ibn Abi al-Izz al-Hanafi. So this is also, you know, Madhab al-Imam Abu Hanifa agrees with this. He actually specify, specifically said that also Tawheed, and when we refer to a Tawheed, we actually refer to the three categories of a Tawheed. Imam Ibn Abi al-Izz al-Hanafi, in his commentary, he is saying that the Tawheed is actually of three types or three categories. And I have here his, actually the translation of this um, commentary uh, by Imam Abi al-Izz. He says, and I'm quoting from his commentary, he said, with Tawheed, one enters into Islam. And with it, one will depart from the word. Because he is referring to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ who said, He whose last words are, there is no God, la ilaha illallah, will enter paradise. So it is the first thing that you enter Islam and it is the last thing that you leave this world with. Then he said, Tawheed is then the beginning of the matter and its end. And then he says, what is meant by this Tawheed is the Tawheed al-Ilahiyya or the belief in the unity of God. For Tawheed has three categories. Again, this is who is saying that? Imam Ibn Abi al-Izz al-Hanafi. He said that the first one, the matters concerning the attributes of Allah, 
which is Tawheed al-Asma wa sifat the names and the attributes. And the second is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, the oneness of his lordship, which states that Allah one alone created everything. And the third one is that Tawheed al-Ilahiyyah, or the oneness of his divinity, that Allah alone is to be worshipped and served without associating any partner to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even in his commentary, he is saying that there are three types of Tawheed. And we go back to what we started with. Like I said, any person who re read the Quran will for sure, after contemplating what Allah Azza wa Jal said, will come up with these three types and you will be able to tell that these ayat are referring to the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only creator. These ayat are referring to the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one worthy of being worshipped. And these ayat are talking about his attributes and his names and the fact that he is unique in them. That he is alone who has these attributes and these, and these names and nobody shares them with him. Tabaraka wa ta'ala. So from all of this, we understand and we're going to go over these three categories of, of uh, Tawheed. Also, remember we talked about the, the Tawheed being the first thing that should be called upon. Right? To call people and invite people, including ourselves. And subhanAllah, I actually missed this hadith. Also from the evidence to this, from the sunnah, is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was quoted in this hadith that is related by Mu'adh ibn Jabal when he was sent to Yemen. Right? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. He alayhi salatu wa sallam sent Mu'adh and he said, you are going to a nation from the people of the scripture, Ahl al-Kitab, and they were Christians. So let the first thing to which you will invite them be the Tawheed of Allah. And if they learn that, then you tell them about what he mandated upon them from the different obligations. Right? So we said that there are three categories of Tawheed. The first one is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, the second one is Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, and the third one is Tawheed al-Asma wa sifat For a person to be called a Muwahid, or to be a, to establish Tawheed, you have to establish Tawheed in all of the three of them. You can't establish Tawheed in one of them and not in the others, and say, I am a Muslim or I am a Muwahid. You have to establish Tawheed in all of them. Negating shirk requires that one of us negate the shirk in all of the three of them. So committing iyadhan billah shirk in one of them makes the person mushrik and has nothing to do with tawheed. So that's why we say that they are inseparable. Tawheed requires tawheed in all of them. Shirk, committing shirk in one of them, only one of them, makes the person as a mushrik and not as a as a muwahid or as a Muslim. What is meant by, let's take each one of them alone, or one at a time, and then let's talk about some ayat where it talks about that type of tawheed, and then, then we'll see what, which one of them is actually meant by tawheed that was sent with the Rusul, with the messengers and with the prophets, and that Allah Azza wa Jal wants from us. So like I said, we said that Tawheed is to actually make something one. And in this case, to make Allah Azza wa Jal one in his Godship, in his uh, divinity, and in his names and attributes. The first one is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. What is meant by Tawheed al-Rububiyyah? When we say the Tawheed in the Godship of Allah Azza wa Jal, it means to believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is one, in the matter of creation. Yani he is the only one who created this whole universe. Nobody helped him and nobody created with him. Or some part of this universe was created by other than Allah Azza wa Jal. Tawheed is to say that, to believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one who created everything, is the only one who provides the sustenance, rizq, or raziq, to believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one who maintains and manages all the affairs in this universe. Whatever he wishes happens, whatever he doesn't, doesn't happen. And nobody can come afterward 
and changes things or undo things that he created, uh, that he decreed or he wanted to happen. Also from this oneness in his Godship is to believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one who gives life and the only one who takes it or put to death, right? And he is the only one who, you know, bestows all the good, you know, he is the one who answers the dua because obviously answering the dua requires what? To provide something. Shifa, children, right? It is all, you know, from the bounties of Allah Azza wa Jal that He provides. All of this is from the oneness in the Godship of Allah Azza wa Jal. What are some of the ayat that point to that? Allah Azza wa Jal, for example, says in the ayah of Surah Al-Ra'd, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل من رب السماوات والأرض قل الله قل أفتخذتم من دونه أولياء لا يملكون لأنفسهم نفعا ولا ضرا قل هل يستوي الأعمى والبصير أم هل تستوي الظلمات والنور أم جعلوا لله شركاء خلقوا كخلقه فتشابه الخلق عليهم قل الله خالق كل شيء the literal translation of this or the meaning say who is the Lord of the heavens and earth say Allah say have you then taken besides him a lies not possessing for themselves any benefit or any harm they cannot do anything say is the blind equivalent to the seeing or is darkness equivalent to light or have they attributed to Allah partners who created like his creation so that the creation of each seemed similar to them so they actually got lost which one is which creation say Allah is the creator of all things and he is the one the prevailing so in here Allah Azza wa Jal we can say that this ayah is about what Tawheed al-Rububiyyah immediately then this ayah is about Tawheed al rububiyyah Another example, Allah Azza wa Jal says in the ayah of Surah Yunus, for example. He says, Inna Rabbakum Allahu alladhi khalaqa al-samawati wal-arda fi sittati ayyam, thumma istawa ala al-arsh yudabbiru al-amr. مَا مِنْ شَفِيعٍ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ إِذْنِهِ ذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُوهُ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ Indeed, your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth. خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ So he is al-khaliq. And the earth in six days and then established himself above the throne arranging the matter of his creation. يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرِ So he is al-mudabbir. Right? Tadbir al-Amr is all in his hands, subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no intercessor except after his permission. That is Allah, your Lord, so worship him. Then will you not remember? Immediately, the fact that we saw that Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, Inna rabbakumu Allahu alladhi khalaq samawati wal ard. So this ayah is what? Is about Tawheed al rububiyyah That he is the creator and he is the sustainer some people by the way may come and say but brother you said that Allah Azza wa Jal is the one, only one who gives life and who takes it or put to death but we know that I can be driving a car and I can hit somebody and put him to death I can kill him we say this is not what is meant by al muhyi wal mumit you are only, when you actually do that, you are only a means that Allah Azza wa Jal made in such a way that it actually causes the killing of somebody else. When you drive in a car and you hit somebody at a high speed, right? More, than, more likely than not, you're going to kill him. But who actually put that person to death? Not you. You were only a sabab. Because we know sometimes you can actually hit somebody and not, and he may not die. How many times have we seen, for example, you know, people in a race car, right? And they get into an accident so bad that just from looking from the outside, you see there is no way this, ca this person can survive. No way. Just looking at the car, you know, it's so damaged. 
that you're going to say that there's no way this person can come out alive from this. And then he walks out literally undamaged. And he walks away. Another person makes a very small accident, minor accident. Or he fell, you know, he falls on the ground in a very minor... You don't expect that this person will die and he dies and it becomes fatal. So all of these are asbab, these all means. Who put to death? Allah Azza wa Jal. And who gives life? Allah Azza wa Jal. So all of these are from the attributes of a rububiyyah. That Allah Azza wa Jal is, is the God and He is the one who creates and who sustains and who, mat who manages the matters and the one subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who gives the rizq and sustains. This type of tawheed, this type of tawheed is a tawheed that the vast majority of humanity actually submitted to. Including the idol worshippers. The idol worshippers, and we're going to see a little bit afterward about this. Even the idol worshippers, they submit and believe that Allah Azza wa is the only creator. They don't actually, by the way, which is very quite interesting. They don't commit shirk in that category of tawheed. They don't dispute the fact that Allah Azza wa is the sole creator of this universe. Nor do they attribute to their gods that they worship that they actually took part in the creation or that they have a share in the creation. They don't say, they don't say that. And we're going to see evidence to that from the Quran in a, a little later. But I wanted to point out that actually even the idol worshippers, right? Quraysh, Al-Awthan, Abadat Al-Awthan, they actually believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only creator. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal called them what? Mushrikeen. And he sent the books down. And he sent messengers to correct that shirk that they still commit. Although they admitted that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only creator. So this means that it is not enough. It is not enough to only and merely believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only creator. It doesn't make a person muhid. Nor does it make the person Muslim. Why? Allah Azza wa Jal called them non-Muslim. Mushrikeen. Yet they actually believed in Allah Azza wa Jal as the only creator. So that's a very important thing. Like I said, remember that because we're going to actually come back. We're going to come back to this in a little while. And I know that once we talk about the three different categories of Tawheed, you may actually feel a little bit Barakallahu fiqh, Zakallah khair you're going to feel a little bit confused. So let's actually make it a little, bit, a little bit easier. The thing, the rule of a thumb to remember. So we said Tawheed al rububiyyah is the fact to believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one who creates, who maintains, who provides sustenance, razib, who puts to death, who, put to, uh, who, who gives life, etc., etc., right? You notice that all of these are type of deeds of what? Of who? Of Allah Azza wa Jal. And yani here we are describing types of deeds that belong to Allah Azza wa Jal. He created. He provides the sustenance. He is the one who puts to death. He is the one who gives life and provides life. He is the one who manages all matters. So we can say, and this is what makes it easier for you to remember the difference. When we say Tawheed al rububiyyah we are referring to Allah's deeds. Yani we are making Allah Azza wa Jal one in His deeds. And we attribute all the deeds that only Allah Azza wa Jal is capable of to Him alone. So in other words, Tawheed al rububiyyah is the Tawheed in His deeds. In the deeds of Allah Azza wa Jal. Does that make it easy? Are you understanding this? So when we say that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only Rabb, which is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, Tawheed al-Rububiyyah is to say that Allah Azza wa Jal is the one 
Rabb. There is no Rabb Siwa. There is no Rabb beside him. Right? And we said this means that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one who creates, is the only one who sustains, is the only one who manages all the affairs, is the only one who gives life and takes it away, etc., etc. So you notice that we are all, in all of this, we are describing whose actions? Allah's action. Actions. Right? Is it making sense? So we are describing all the actions of Allah Azza wa Jal, and we say that He is the only one who does all of these. Making sense? So in other words, we say that Tawheed al-Rububiyya is to actually make Tawheed in the actions of Allah Azza wa Jal. To attribute all of these actions to Allah and only Allah. And this is the meaning of Rabb. This is the meaning of a rub. A side note, just so that to give you a little bit more understanding, a side note, that is why, ya akhwan, if you go through the Quran and through the Sunnah, wherever you say, wherever you see a dua, you're going to always, always see that Allah Azza wa Jal or the Prophet uses the word rub. Rabbana ghfir lana wa li ikhwanina alladhina sabakuna bil Islam, bil Iman. ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به. So all the type of dua where we ask Allah Azza wa Jal for something, it is always referred for in the name of Rabb. Why? Because we're asking for something. And who provides? Rabb. His actions. He is the one who provides. Right? وإذا مرت فهو يشفين. So you're going to see always that it is the word of Rabb that is used. Side note, like I said, it is a side note. Why? Because Allah Azza wa Jal, who is capable of sustenance, providing sustenance. And He is the one who actually gives shifa and rizq and children. Right? Time. The next type of tawheed is tawheed al uluhiyyah which is the Tawheed in divinity of Allah Azza wa Jal. Which is to say that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only deity or true God who is worthy of being worshipped. And by the way, this Tawheed is the meaning of La ilaha illallah, the, the first portion of the Kalimat al-Tawheed. The reason I say this, by the way, again, this is actually a quick, quick side note. Subhanallah, recently, I, I don't want to mention which masjid, I was listening to a khutbah at a, one, at, at a masjid. And the khatib started off his khutbah by saying, among other things, and then he said, وَأَشْهَدُ أَن لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهِ إِقْرَارًا بِرُبُوبِيَتِهِ So Subhanallah, it kind of struck me. It immediately got into my mind. I'm like, wait a minute. What? وَأَشْهَدُ أَن لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهِ إِقْرَارًا بِرُبُوبِيَتِهِ إِقْرَارًا meaning confirming. This is not a confirmation of his rububiyya. This is a confirmation of his uluhiyya. Now, I don't know if it was a mis, you know, statement from him. I don't want to speculate. Allah alam. I don't know. Maybe he said it on purpose, maybe he said it inadvertently. It could be a slip of the, of the tongue, right? He, or it could be the language or whatever. But the point is that if he said it on purpose, it is a misunderstanding of this word, a statement. He should have said, إِقْرَارًا بِأُلُوهِيَّتِهِ because kalimat al-tawheed, la ilaha illallah, you're actually negating that there is any true God but Allah. And this is Tawheed al uluhiya in the Kachib. And this is the meaning of this, this second category of Tawheed, where we say that it is the meaning that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one worthy of being worshipped. So it is Tawheed al ibadah right? Or we can say Tawheed al uluhiya either Tawheed al uluhiya or Tawheed al ibadah which is, in other words, to only 
attribute and to only direct all the acts of worship of the servant toward Allah Azza wa Jal only and nobody beside him. So if you compare it to Tawheed al rububiyyah now we are talking about whose actions? Our actions. Because I am saying my acts of worship, any type of, of, of worship, I only direct them to Allah Azza wa Jal because He is the only one of, worthy of, of them. So you see the difference between the two, just so that it makes it easier. So when we say Tawheed al uluhiyyah we are actually making Allah Azza wa Jal one, yani in other words, unity of Allah Azza wa Jal with respect to our deeds as opposed to his deeds in Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. Is it making sense? So all of my absolute love to Allah Azza wa Jal, all of my absolute fear, it is from Allah Azza wa Jal, all of my utmost hope in Allah Azza wa Jal, all of my, you know, dua is only to Allah Azza wa Jal, my salah to Allah Azza wa Jal, my slaughtering to Allah Azza wa Jal. My repentance only to Allah Azza wa Jal. All the types of my actions of worship, I direct them only to Allah Azza wa Jal with, his, with love and with fear and with hope in Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is what it means to have or to believe in Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah which is the, the Tawheed in the divinity of Allah Azza wa Jal. Some of the examples, so we've given examples about Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. What are the examples of Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah? Allah Azza wa Jal, for example, says in the ayah of Surah Sad, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala says, وَعَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْذِرٌ مِّنْهُمْ وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ this is what they said. They said, and they wonder that there has come to them a warner from among themselves, and the disbelievers say, this is a magician or a liar. Has he made the gods only one god? Indeed, this is a curious thing. Ajib. This is what they claim. He made, he made all the gods, only one god. Indeed, this is a wonderful or a curious thing. So this is an example of Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah. And like I said, this is, a, in, this is indeed Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah is the meaning of Kalimat al-Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, which means that there is no true god worthy of being worshipped except Allah. It doesn't mean that there is no Rabb Siwa. There is no Rabb except Allah. That's wrong. Because if this is, was the meaning, well, wait a minute. Mushriki Quraysh already admit that. They have no problem with that. They already say this. The Mushriki Quraysh who, used, who lived at the time of the Prophet وسلم, whom he was sent to, they already admit this then there is no issue. If that was the meaning, he actually was sent to them. And Allah Azza wa Jal sent the Quran to them. And he even made jihad toward them. He fought them to admit to La ilaha illallah. If we say that the meaning of it, then it is there is no Rabb Siwa. They already know that. They already admit to it. They already believe in it. Then it should have been a no issue. No problem. They already admit to this. They're not disputing that. You notice this? They're not disputing that. Yet, Allah Azza wa Jal sent the Quran down and sent Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to them. And he even fought them so that they submit to La ilaha illallah, which means that there is no true God beside Allah. And this is the meaning of the ayah actually, because this la ilaha illallah, it is the same meaning of the ayah of Surah Al Hajj. ذلك بأن الله هو الحق وأن ما يدعون من دونه هو الباطل وأن الله هو العلي الكبير. That is because Allah is the truth, and that which they call upon other than Him, 
is falsehood battle and Allah and because Allah is the most high the grand so this is the meaning of Tawheed al-Rububiyyah Tawheed al-Iluhiyyah I'm sorry we come to the last type of Tawheed which is Tawheed al-Asma' wa sifat which is the Tawheed in the beautiful names and the sublime attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal which is to believe that Allah Azza wa Jal has beautiful names and sublime attributes and he is unique in them he is the only one who has these beautiful names and you and sublime attributes and no one share them with him subhanahu wa ta'ala nobody from his creation whether they are righteous whether they are messengers whether they are prophets whether they are awliya no matter nobody resembles allah azza wa jal in these names and attributes and he is unique in them he is one in these names and attributes hence tawheed al asma wa sifat tawheed of the names and the attributes of allah azza wa jal examples of those are too many to mention some of them is the very surat al ikhlas where allah azza wa jal says qul huwa allahu ahad that's an attribute of allah azza wa jal allahu samad that's another attribute of Allah Azza wa Jal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. These are two attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. That's another yet another attribute of Allah Azza wa Jal. Where Allah Azza wa Jal says, Say, He is Allah who is one. Allah, the eternal refuge. He neither begets nor is born, nor is there to Him any equivalent. All of, all of these are what, Akhuna Mushtaba? Sifat. Naam. Also, Allah Azza wa Jal says in the ayah of Surah Al-Shura, فَاطِرُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ جَعَلَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَمِنَ الْأَنْعَامِ أَزْوَاجًا يَذَرُكُمْ فِيهِ لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ نعم يَذَرَأُكُمْ فِيهِ I'm sorry. يَذَرَأُكُمْ فِيهِ لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ يعني he is the creator of the heavens and the earth he has made for you from yourselves mates and among the cattle's mates he multiplies you thereby there is nothing like unto him and he is the hearing and the seeing the hearing and the seeing are what attributes sifat attributes of allah azza wa jal one attribute is that he is seeing Another one is that he is hearing. Yani he sees and hears, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet, there is nothing like unto him. We see. And we hear. But his hearing and his seeing is different. And our seeing and our hearing is so different than his hearing and his seeing. Although the word, the term of the attribute is the same. We see and he see. We hear and he hears. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the reality of the hearing and the reality of the seeing are quite different. Quite different. So Allah Azza wa Jal is one in these attributes and in these uh, names that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the way, commit shirk in this aspect of the tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jal. There are people, for example, who claim that they know the unseen or part of the unseen they claim that they have some of the knowledge of the unseen that is an attribute right knowing the unseen is an attribute because this is knowledge so it is an attribute who knows the unseen Allah Azza wa Jal قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الْغَيْبَ إِلَّا الله. Say none in the skies and on, and in, on, on the earth who knows the unseen except Allah. Some people come and say, well, I know part of the unseen. Or they claim that I know part of the unseen. And this is quite spread, quite spread in some portions of the word, Muslim word. Right? This is what? This is shirk in al-asma' wa sifat They even deceive people. And they say... I also see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the awake and I ask him about what some people you know are thinking within themselves what they're thinking 
right? To know about their statuses, to go back and say, well, I know, I can tell you what you're thinking or what, what's inside you. This is all shirk of al-asma wa sifat because they say, no one knows al-ghayb except Allah. قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الْغَيْبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Except Allah Azza wa Jal. Also like that poem that a lot of people actually make it a way of drawing closer to Allah Azza wa Jal by reciting it over and over again. And it contains several verses that are pure shirk wal billah where the poet said for example فَإِنَّ مِنْ جُودِكَ الدُّنْيَا وَضَرَّتَهَا وَمِنْ عُلُومِكَ عِلْمُ اللَّوْحِ وَالْقَلَمِ Allahu Akbar With the meaning of which yani he is addressing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he is saying that all of this dunya and all that is within it is from your generosity, O Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from your knowledge, from your knowledge is the knowledge of al-lawh and al-qalam. Allahu Akbar, yani one has to wonder, so what is left to Allah Azza wa Jal? What is left to Allah Azza wa Jal? What's else? Ajeeb. If this is all within the power of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, question, question, what is left to Allah? Yani if this universe and this dunya and everything in it is from the generosity of Rasulullah sallallahu and from his knowledge alayhi salatu was now obviously he's innocent from all of this it's all claim and if all of this from his knowledge is the knowledge of lawh al-mahfuz and al-qalam and what it wrote ajeeb I wonder what else is remaining to Allah Azza wa Jal. Subhanallah. If Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us about His Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam, that He doesn't know the unseen Himself while alive, let alone after He passed away alayhi salatu wassalam. Allah Azza wa Jal says about His Prophet, say, وَلَوْ كُنْتُ أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبِ لَسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ and if I know, and if I know the unseen, and if I know the unseen, then I would have actually amassed from the khair, and no harm would have hit me or happened to me. This is while alive. How about after his death, alayhi salatu wassalam? He couldn't do it while alive. How can he do it while he is dead? Subhanallah, ajeeb. This is what we mean by Tawheed al-Asma wa sifat And this is some examples, right? And some demonstrations of shirk in these aspects. In the Asma and the Sifat, the names and the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. The knowledge of the unseen is only an attribute of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it should be only attributed to Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is Tawheed al-Asma wa sifat To also say that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one who can hear everything perfectly no matter where you happen to be no wali can do that no habit inhabitant of a grave can do that no messenger can do that no angel can do that only allah azza wa jal that is tawheed knowledge of what every person is doing private public in any case in any status that is only from the knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal. Anybody who claims that, he is committing shirk in al-asma wa sifat In the names and the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Wal-iyadu billah. Some examples of these, let's take examples from the ayat. Allah Azza wa Jal says, for example, in the ayah of Surah Al-A'raf, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا وَذَرُوا الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ فِي أَسْمَائِهِ سَيُجِزَوْنَ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ And to Allah be, 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 uh, belong the best names. So invoke him with them. And leave those who practice deviation concerning his names. They will be recompensed for what they have been doing. 
Also Allah Azza wa Jal says in the ayah of Surah An-Nahl, لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ مَثَلُ السَّوْءِ وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ for those who do not believe in the hereafter is the description of evil and for Allah is the highest attribute and example. He is, he, and He is the exalted in might and the wise. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has the best example, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of these are from the Tawheed of Al-Asma' wa Sifat. Tawheed in the names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. We started off, if you remember, ya Akhwan, we said that Tawheed al rububiyya is something that the idol worshippers did not dispute. Right? They actually believed in it. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal called them Mushrikeen. And we said this is actually one of the proofs that a Tawheed is actually three types, not one type. If you remember, we said that because some people actually submitted and believe in the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal in His deeds, in His creation, being the only creator. Yet, Allah Azza wa Jal called them mushrikeen. So this means that there is something else that they did not believe, that they commit shirk and they made equals to Allah Azza wa Jal in. And to only believe in the Tawheed al rububiyya is not enough to make the person Muslim. But rather, a person must believe in all of the three of them. That he believes that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only Rabb. That Allah Azza wa Jal is the only Ilah. And that he is the only one who has those names and attributes. We said that Allah Azza wa Jal confirmed that they believed in these. And in, in that he is the only creator. Here are some ayat where Allah Azza wa Jal confirmed that. Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Luqman, A'udhu Billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ قُلِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ بَلْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And if you ask them, who created the heavens and earth, they would surely say Allah, say all praise is due to Allah, but most of them do not know. So do they admit that he is the only creator or not? If you ask them. So Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, if you ask them who created the skies and the earth, they will surely admit that it is only Allah. Yet he is saying, But most of them do not know. In another set of ayat, and this is quite interesting, subhanAllah, look at these ayat where Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Mu'mineen, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, قُلْ لِمَنِ الْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهَا إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Say Muhammad, O Muhammad, or say Muhammad, yani say to them, to whom belongs the earth and whoever is in it, if you should know. سَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّهِ قُلْ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ they will say to Allah, say then, will you not remember? قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ السَّبْعِ وَرَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ Say, who is the Lord of the seven heavens and the Lord of the great throne? سَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّهِ قُلْ أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ They will say, they belong to Allah. Say then, will you not fear Him? قُلْ مَنْ بِيَدِهِ مَلَكُوتُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ يُجِيرُ وَلَا يُجَارُ عَلَيْهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Say in whose hand is the realm of all things and he protects while none can protect against him if you should know. سَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّهِ قُلْ فَأَنَّا تُسْحَرُونَ They will say all belongs to Allah. Say then how are you deluded? How are you deluded from the fact that he is the only one to be worshipped then? So they, they admit that Allah Azza wa is the one who creates and owns and maintains. And nobody can protect except him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then in another ayah in Surah Az-Zumar, Allah Azza wa says, خَلَقَكُمْ مِن نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ 
ثم جعل منها زوجها وأنزل لكم من الأنعام ثمانية أزواج يخلقكم في بطون أمهاتكم خلقا من بعد خلق في ظلمات ثلاث ذلكم الله ربكم له الملك لا إله إلا هو فأنا تصرفون He created you from one soul then he made from it its mate and he produced from you from the grazing livestock eight mates he creates you in the wombs of your mothers creation after creation within three darknesses that is Allah your Lord that is Allah your Lord to him belongs dominion there is no deity except except him so how are you averted and by the way Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran the reasoning of Allah and the reasoning of the Quran to establish the argument on those people who commit shirk in al-uluhiyyah is to actually start from what they believe in and what they agree upon to establish the proof that he is the only one who is worthy of deity of, of worship that he is the only true deity who deserves to be worshipped and I know I'm, I took a little bit of time but you know let me just try to finish here inshallah and maybe we can stop and continue a little bit afterward but what I wanted to say in here ya akhwan is that there is actually a very strong connection between the three types of Tawheed so we said there are three types of Tawheed but they're not independent completely Tawheed al-Rububiyya is actually a proof on Tawheed al-Uluhiyya why? because Allah Azza wa Jal keeps on telling us I am the one who created everything I am the one who provides sustenance I am the one who maintains all, ma all matter nobody can, can, uh, 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 can manage any matters except myself how can you then go and worship somebody else who hasn't created who doesn't have anything in the creation you worship him for what he doesn't do anything of what Allah Azza wa Jal does so the one who is worthy of being worshipped is the one who creates and provides sustenance and manages all affairs that is why he deserves to be worshipped and those idols that you claim that they are equal in worship with Allah Azza wa Jal can they create like what he, Allah Azza wa Jal created can they manage like Allah Azza wa Jal manages the, all affairs can they give life and take it put to death they cannot do any of that so how do you worship them then the one who does all of this is the one who deserves to be worshipped so Allah being the creator makes him deserve to be the ilah, the deity to be to be worshipped and that is why we see this quite often in the Quran that Allah Azza wa Jal establishes the proof on Mushriki Quraysh that he is the only one he proves that he is the only one who deserves to be worshipped because the only he is the only one who created everything and manages all affairs yani he is the Rabb that is why he is al ilah you see the connection he is the Rabb who has the beautiful names and the great attributes that is why he deserves to be worshipped and he is the al ilah and all of those from those you worship they cannot do any of that they are incapable in power or they don't have the power to create any of what Allah Azza wa Jal is referring to let's stop here and take a you know quick break inshallah I have maybe another 10 or 15 minutes no more but we'll do it afterward inshallah well let's come back but let's take a break quick break inshallah barakallah fikum
believe? Bitawfiqillahi azza wa jal. So he is disavowing his own power and his own intelligence, and he is depending on the on the power and the ability and the tawfiq of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is like I said, this is from the adab of the ulama, of the scholars, that whatever they do and whatever they are able to understand and be able to see that haq or batil, it is only that they they admit and they thank Allah Azza wa Jal and they are grateful for his tawfiq that he actually made them see and be able to do and, and gave them the knowledge to actually do all of this. This is what uh, Allah Azza wa Jal gave me the tawfiq again to say with respect to that one statement, which is number two, that uh, about the tawheed and about its categories. I hope in this quick uh, or relatively short halaqa that I was able to um, yani, uh, convey the truth and make you understand uh, the true meaning of tawheed and the three categories. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to apply it now and to hold it as our guide in our life until we meet Allah azza wa jal. Hadha wa billahi at-tawfiq wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walah. Any questions? Comments? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, now we are getting the heat finally recorded. <clears throat> so my question is, I usually get this all the time. When I tell the people who ask, seek help from other than Allah, I tell them that this is shirk. So the immediate reaction that I get, are you calling me a mushrik? And uh, you are calling me a mushrik. Even though I never mentioned that this is, you are a mushrik. So I'm just mentioning that this act is a shirk. Uh, so how do we handle this situation? And also, if somebody commits a kufr, does he become a kafir? So the question really is about if you see somebody who is committing an act of shirk, and if you bring it to their attention or you talk to them and try to correct them, they immediately answer back and they say, are you calling me a kafir now or a mushrik? And the answer to that is obviously there is a big difference between the two. You know, guiding somebody and showing somebody that some of what he's doing or an act that he's doing or she's doing is an act of shirk and pointing that out and you know, bringing the evidences to that that doesn't necessarily mean that we are actually accusing that person of being a mushrik. Because like I said, there is a big difference between being a mushrik and between committing an act of shirk. There are, you know, labeling somebody a mushrik or, you know, confirming that hukum of a shirk on an individual is none of our business. None of our business. It's not me who judges that this person is a mushrik or not. My job is I am a ad'u ilallah. If I see somebody doing something wrong, I point, it that, I point that out to them. And I do it in the best words and the best terms that I can find. And with, you know, not, you know approaching the person on the side, because this is nasiha, advice. And the advice is not shaming, right? And my intent is fi sabilillah. I want that person to see the haqq and be corrected. It is not my intention to shame him so that everybody knows that he's doing something wrong. If Allah Azza wa Jal protected him or, or covered him up, I don't want to uncover him. I want him to see that what he's doing is wrong. And this is actually what the, what the messengers and the prophets did. Whenever they saw their people doing something wrong, they corrected it. So we're not doing anything beyond what the Rusul and the Anbiya alayhimu salatu wassalam, our teachers, what they did. And that is the, and that is the duty of every da'iyah ilallah. Every da'iyah ilallah should actually, you know, uh, if, if you see something wrong or if you see some, um, you know, uh, shortcomings, then you remind people and that's what we could do, right? 
So labeling or judging somebody as a mushrik, this is the duty of the Muslim judge. He is the one who can actually establish the proof and make sure that he doesn't have any doubt or any misunderstanding, right? Or any ignorance. You know, the person may be actually committing the shirk out of ignorance. He didn't know. So when you come and teach them, we're not saying that you're mushrik right out of the bat. We're actually pointing that out in a brotherly way, out of love for his khair. That brother, what you're doing is wrong. You may not know it, but this is what Allah Azza wa Jal and his messenger say. And this is serious. It has serious consequences, right? I'm not saying that you are mushrik. You may not, you might, you may not have known that it is wrong. Or you may have a shubha, doubt, right? Or misunderstanding. You thought it was something else, right? That is why we mentioned this before. Let me just finish the answer by this. We said that Tariq al-Salah, the one who doesn't perform prayer, he is kafir billah al-Azim wal billah. But doesn't mean that if now if I see anybody who is not praying, oh yeah, kafir. No, it's not my job. And he may not have known that not praying is a reason for kufr wal billah. He may, he may be ignorant, right? So it's not me to label. It's not up to me. I, it's not my job. My job is to correct with what Allah Azza wa Jal has given me knowledge to guide people. Hidayat al bayan wal irshad, right? To show and to show them the proof. And the hidayah of tawfiq is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. May Allah guide us all. Now, and uh, I'm sorry, one last thing. Not any person who commits shirk or kufr is a mushrik or kafir. Not necessarily. Like I said, it could be due, uh, due to ignorance. That doesn't make the person a mushrik or a kafir. Like we say, not everybody who does an innovation is an innovator. Big difference, right? Until we establish the proof on them and make them make sure that they understand there are no obstacles and there's no misunderstanding, right? And it is like I said, due to the Muslim judge, who can do that? Until then, there is a big difference. Now. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I just have one question. Uh, if I go and tell somebody, a person, okay, I go and tell someone, um, for example, I just go and tell a uh, person A, and I tell him, I pray him uh, to cause a harm to another person, person B. Not with the hitman or anything, not physically. But he can do, I believe that he can do something which is going to cause harm to person C. They are not nowhere, let's say, I mean, he's in, this, the guy who I'm asking, he's in US. The guy who I want to make harm is in Saudi or India, anywhere. Believing that, is that against Tawheed? So basically the question, uh, to summarize it, make sure that I understand the question first so that I can answer it. The question is, if somebody believes that somebody else geographically distant can harm you, is that against Tawheed or not? Is that the question? That he can do something, make harm to another person. That is my question. I mean, so somebody that claims that he can do that. <laughs> I want to ask the next. <laughs> so somebody claims that he can do that. Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, he opened it. I mean, I, I was waiting for the answer. So what about the sihr? I mean, sihr also the same thing. I mean, I'm just going and tell someone if I believe in sihr. Yeah, is it not against tawhid? Kabair, kabair is the major sins. To do it or to believe in it is from the major sins. Actually, we talked about it, but part of the Tawheed. But back to the question, the original question that you had. Somebody who claim that he can harm another person who is geographically distant, right? From his place. Or somebody who believes and is afraid that somebody else can ha harm him while well, that person is, again, geographically distinct, distant, all of this is against Tawheed and is actually Iyadan Billah, one type of shirk. 
Shirk in which part? Yeah, I know Shirk Billah, but which part? <laughs> All Shirk is in Shirk Illa, Billah. Let me make it clearer. We said there are three types of Tawheed, remember? Type. Shirk under which category? This is what I meant. I, shirk in Asma was Sifat. Asma was Sifat. Why? Ya Khwan, who can harm in an absolute way the way this person claims to be able to, capable of? Who can do that? Allah Azza wa Jal, from His names and attributes, is that He is a Nafi' and a Dar. Yani he is the one who can provide benefit. He can the one who can provide the manfa'a, nafa'a. And he is the one who can harm, al-dar. That is why we seek protection in who? Allah Azza wa Jal, because he is the one who ward off evil and, and, and harm. And we ask for benefit from who? لَأَنُّ هُوَ النَّافِعَ who is the one who can provide that? So when that person claims that he is able to do that, then what he effectively did, he made himself peer to Allah Azza wa Jal in that attribute. And that is exactly shirk. What is shirk, ya akhwan? But seriously, because a lot of people actually don't understand what is the meaning of shirk to begin with. What is shirk? If somebody asks you, why is the shirk? What is shirk? It has nothing to do with shirk. Because some people have a narrow understanding of what shirk is. I'll tell you, uh, we actually talked about this before, but I'll refresh your memory. If definition of a shirk is to actually equate something or someone with Allah Azza wa Jal in any aspect that, is all, that only Allah Azza wa Jal is capable of. Let's take a few examples to answer that. If, you, if somebody claims that somebody created the moon, he is committing shirk because he made somebody peer to Allah Azza wa Jal in being able to create. And Allah Azza wa Jal is the only creator. So this is shirk in, in rububiyyah. He is the only Rabb. Another person comes and claims, well, wait a minute, I can provide rizq. Come, seek the rizq from me. You say, this is shirk because the raziq hu Allah. So you are equating that person with Allah Azza wa Jal in the ability of providing a rizq. And we say Allah Azza wa Jal is a raziq. La raziq siwa. Nobody can provide rizq except him subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are only means. Allah Azza wa Jal did not make it in such a way that it rains dollars. You know? <laughs> but he provided means. But that doesn't make you as a raziq. You are, for example, the owner of the business. I work for you. You, you give me salary at the end of the, of the month or bi-weekly. That doesn't make you a raziq. You're only a means. No. Allah Azza wa Jal remains the raziq. Somebody who claims that I can see somebody in India. Here, from my place in here. MashaAllah. Allahu Akbar. Without satellite, without anything. Yeah, something. Or somebody can say, you know, from my place here, you're, you're able to you see me. I'm from my place in here. I just went perform, perform pilgrimage and came back. MashaAllah. Yeah. Over the clouds. Or some people claim, from my place in here, don't you want to pray Isha? La, alhamdulillah, I just prayed in Al Haram. From my place here, I didn't, I didn't move. All of is shirk. Because back, going back to the definition, and I want everybody to actually memorize this and remember this. What is shirk? Shirk is equating. Because it is from shariq. Shiani shirk. You need to make a shariq to Allah Azza wa Jal. A partner. And the partners are equal. Right? So to equate with Allah Azza wa Jal something or somebody in any aspect that only Allah Azza wa Jal is capable of. Nah, alhamdulillah. That's, once you have this definition, it becomes easy, inshallah. Right? Who can see in that way? Only Allah Azza wa Jal. Who can hear? Only Allah Azza wa Jal. My hearing is very limited. 
I couldn't hear somebody in that street, let alone the other side of Illinois. Now India goes without saying. No way. <laughs> right? Or somebody diseased. Ya Hussein. Allahu Akbar. You make istighatha by al Hussein. Where is al Hussein? Or Muhammad. Ya Muhammad. Ya Ali. <laughs> they cannot hear. They cannot hear you or Ya Jilani or etc. etc. Ya Qadiri. Ya. How can they hear you? Allah Azza wa Jal, only one who can hear in that fashion. Look, ya akhi, wallahi, we are human beings. SubhanAllah, we are very, very, very weak. If something gets in our ear, our hearing becomes so reduced. Water gets in our ear and we can hardly hear now. You have to go to a hearing aid and, you know, and they put you in this very closed room to test your hearing and see how you, right? Come on, we are Bashar. <laughs> nah. Salam. So the Mushrikeen of Quraysh, they believed uh, that Allah was the creator, Allah was the sustainer. But they would ask the idols to get closer to Allah. That was what they believed. They would go through the idols. To, and they said, لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ to bring, the, to bring us closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. So they would go and, for example, slaughter for the idol so that it, it, they, it is pleased with them to get its pleasure so that it intercede on their behalf with Allah Azza wa Jal. Now. This is similar to people asking like a tree, a stone, an idol, or people in their graves. They cannot hear, they cannot respond, they cannot take us closer to Allah in any way. All of this is shirk in either the names and attributes or shirk in the Uluhiyya, in the divinity. Because if you uh, direct a portion of your acts of worship toward these things, then you equate them with Allah Azza wa He is the only one true God worthy of worship. So when you worship somebody else or something else beside Allah Azza wa Jal, you equate it. That is true. Assalamu alaikum. Well, I'm just uh, trying to explain. Actually, I want you to explain a little bit more, specify that. Because he asked, you know, about the shirk. The people who go to Mazar, like Jilani, Malana Hazrat Jilani, whatever, they go and they go down, you know, they prostitute over there, you know. And if, if you know, there's a lot of uh, places in, in Pakistan, I know that, that people go there and bore them, you know, things like that. And they ask them, literally. And you know, when you talk to them, they start fighting with you and they are saying that, like you said, is that not a mushrik? A person who is doing in front of you and then have a proof of it? If he is doing this with knowledge and with understanding, then obviously that's a mushrik. Now we say a lot of these people are actually ignorant. Or a lot of them, they have a misunderstanding. That's what they were taught. They don't know anything else. So in their own mind, they don't know that they're actually committing shirk. What they're committing is shirk. But a lot of them are ignorant. A lot of them, this is all what they know. So this is why I say, Akhwan, Wallahi, one of the greatest uh, shortcomings that the Ummah has today. We're not doing enough in terms of teaching people. I take blame, by the way. I blame myself and I blame all the people of knowledge. And I'm nobody, by the way. But I, I blame all the people of knowledge that we are not doing enough to preach and teach people. And there is a lot of ignorance in our, in our ummah, by the way. So before we actually judge them, right? Or before we actually, you know, uh, uh, label them as mushrik, we need to make sure, do they actually understand that this, what they're doing is shirk? They think I'm ignorant. Well, that's another story. Now, again, but, uh, you know, again, we're not judges, but what I'm saying is, if we make it clear to them, and they insist, you know, we provide the proofs, and you actually explain it, and make it the clearest possible, and they still don't submit to this out of arrogance, right, and our, 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 out of rejection, then this is another story. But again, this has to be done in front of a judge. Now. 
But rejecting it out of kibir and out of arrogance, right? Then that's, that's a very serious matter. Yeah. So I got a <clears throat> response from somebody who does that. So the proof that they provide is uh, the ayah of the Quran, Surah 555. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Verily, your wali protector or helper is Allah, his messenger and the believer. Those who perform a, a salat, iqam a salat and give zakat and they bow down to maybe I'm not is that the right one yeah yeah Wali comes with different meaning so obviously what they're trying to do in here right they're actually mixing things together on you and trying to convince you that in this area the meaning is that the meaning are now becoming you know protectors and, and, and whatnot and that's not the case Al Wali comes from the word Walaya and the walaya, which is the source of the word, it means two things. Love and support. Right? Yani when I say I am wali of you, means I love you, right? And I'll back you up. That is why Allah Azza wa Jal says, yani They love one another and they support one another. Yani they help one another. Right? The ayah in here is that Allah, uh, that innama waliyukum Allah wa rasuluhu wa alladhina amanu. Yani we love Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal also loves the mu'minin and he provides support to them. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the mu'minin they have walaya to, to Allah Azza wa Jal and to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because they love their Lord and they also support his deen. This has nothing to do with protection. And they obviously don't, don't, don't believe that they actually protect. And Akhwan, like I said, Yanni, this goes back to be frank with you. You know, we are uh, in the process of explaining al aqidah al-Tahawiyyah. And you're going to see a little afterward, right, that Imam Abu Jafar al-Tahawi actually makes it so clear, right, that all of these are attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the wali, no matter how high he gets or she gets, right? It is not the meaning that they refer to because they make al wali as somebody who is superficial, right? Super, yani, su superman, in other words. That's not the case. And we actually, I had a khutbah in here to talk about what al walaya is and what the wali means and what is the path to, be re to, to receive, to, 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 uh, to, to reach that status of al walaya. Ya akhwan, al walaya, al wali is every mu'min taqi. Every mu'min taqi is a wali. He doesn't have to be from a certain lineage or wearing a certain, you know, garment and color and you're right and, 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 and dress in a certain way. This has nothing to do with the walaya. The wali is every mu'min taqi. Is a wali. Right? So every mu'min is a wali of Allah Azza wa Jal. Why? Because being a mu'min and being a taqi, it means that you love Allah Azza wa Jal and you support him. You support his deen. This is al walaya. Nobody protects except Allah Azza wa Jal. Nobody. Okay. Well, the thing is here, I probably said before, the teaching in India and Pakistan especially, okay, and the other, and the Arabic culture is different. Over there, wali means, wali all, yeah, I mean, so the, like as a highest rank. I mean, I have everything. When you call myself, if I call myself Bali, he said, what's wrong with you? You're, you know, you're, yeah, yeah, I know you're, you're getting crazy, you know. Huh? <laughs> wali is like friend of Allah, Wali Allah. Exactly. Yes, we call it Wali of Allah. But they call a Wali Allah only the person who has a very high standard or high, higher knowledge, basically. And, uh, you know, he prays like day and night, 24 hours, things like that. That's in front of them, it's like a wali Allah is that person. I cannot say myself, I'm Ali, this is now, you are, you know, things like that. So see, the teaching of the Quran, basically, is not clear out there. How I many, you know, things like that. They are still, like you said, that ignorance. I mean, you know, that probably comes from the right word for that. Hey, but, yeah. 
maybe that's the case and you can see it actually. The reason they actually take the term out of context and they actually attribute different, a different meaning to it because they actually get a benefit out of it. Because now it is becoming a source of getting respect, income, you'll become revered, you know, people will look up to you, you become somebody who is, you know, who's got, uh, you know, revered by people and, you know, they actually pay you because they think they're doing a great quruba to Allah Azza wa Jal, right? So, and then these people start to make things, weird things that any, Mus any other Muslim is not allowed to do. So how, this is what's interesting, how are you wali when you do things that Allah Azza wa Jal forbid, but you think yourself above the tashri'ah? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi didn't do that. So that's why we say that they are crossing the marks. They are brothers. They are crossing the marks. Yeah. That's not walaya. This has nothing to do with walaya, by the way. That's not al walaya. And we said over and over again, ya akhwan, the only path, there is no other path. The only path to the walaya is the path of the sharia, the path of ibadah. And Hadith al-Wali, we've explained it over and over again. And again, I, like I said, I gave a khutbah over here uh, uh, explaining that Hadith. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Hadith Qudsi that أفل حتى أحبه يعني the best thing وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَضْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ يعني the servant of me, Allah Azza wa Jal is talking, my servant does not draw closer to me, better, more beloved to me, more than actually carrying out the fara'id that I mandated upon him. And then he adds above and beyond by doing in nawafil until I love him. That is the path of walaya, ya akhwan. There is no secret ingredient in here and weird stuff. It has nothing to do with walaya. Nothing. This is the hadith. The only path to Allah Azza wa Jal is the path of Sharia, the path of Ibadah to Allah Azza wa Jal. That's what makes people better than others. That's it. Even if I come from this lineage or that lineage, how, by Allah, how can a lineage, my lineage, makes me better than others? Subhanallah. <laughs> Just being the mere fact, being that you are the descendant from a particular lineage, that makes you a wali? has nothing to do with that. Now, do we have time? I think we're running out of time. Yeah. Let's do it next week, inshallah. That's what. Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.